question I'm posing that you often hear is, what about those who've never heard? Have you ever had somebody ask you that? What about those who've, who've never heard? And there are. There's people who are alive today who've never heard about the Bible or Jesus or salvation. Uh, you'd be surprised how many Australians have no idea what it means to be a Christian or, or about God and those things. In Romans chapter 1, I thought we'd start by uh, answering, well, first of all, what, what do they need to hear? Romans chapter uh, 1, uh, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. I'm just going to stop reading there. We're really mainly looking this morning at Romans chapter 1. And Paul here at the beginning lays out really what are the foundations of Christianity. Uh, number one, the promises of God, the Bible, there in verse 2. He promised by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And two, uh, the person of Jesus Christ in verses 3 and 4, concerning his son Jesus Christ. Those are the two basic things that people need to hear. They need to hear what God's Word says about Jesus Christ. Uh, the promise of God. You know, God's promise is not new. Do you realize that he talks about the gospel there in verse 1, separated under the gospel of God? Do you realize that God began to talk about the gospel in, in Genesis chapter 3? <laughs> you know, right after we had sinned in Adam, uh, God is actually talking to the devil, the snake, and he, he, he says in, in Genesis chapter 3, let me, let me read it so I make sure I get it right here. Genesis chapter 3 and, and verse 14, or uh, verse 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Uh, that's the first prophecy or promise about the coming of, of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And then in Genesis 3.21, he illustrates it when unto Adam also and his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Do you realize the first one that killed an animal was God? And he did it to cover them. The blood was shed, and it was a picture of, of, the, of the coming of Jesus Christ, uh, the promised one. It's not new. Uh, Isaiah 53, you know, all through the Old Testament, he, he talks about the one who would come the reason I mention Isaiah 53 is, is it's obviously about the crucifixion of Jesus before they ever crucified anybody. Uh, hundreds of years before Jesus, Jesus came. Uh, spelled out then, of course, in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 15, where he talks about uh, the resurrection, the gospel. He defines the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Is, is Jesus Christ, the good news. That's what the Holy Scriptures are about. The Bible says in Romans 10, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. People need to hear what God has said, and particularly what he said in the gospel about Jesus. And then it says in verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ. It's important that people know who Jesus is. You'd be amazed who people think Jesus is. <laughs> You know, people make all kinds of weird statements about Jesus. and uh, Listen, he is unique in all of history, is the, the person of Jesus Christ. He was a specific person. He wasn't just somebody that just happened to be there at the time. Uh, the Bible says there in verse 3 uh, that he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Physically speaking, he had a heritage. He traced it, one of them, uh, Matthew and Luke, give his heritage. One of them traces it all the way back to Adam. The other one, I think it starts with Abraham. Uh, it was a specific person that God was moving through history, preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. But then in verse 4 it says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness. The Holy Spirit says, This is the Son of God. Uh, and he says in verse 4 that it's declared by the resurrection uh, from the dead. 
The resurrection is what sets Christ and Christianity apart from anything else in the world. It's, it's the basis of faith. In Romans 10, 9, it says, when you trust Christ, one of, the, one of the main things you're believing is that Christ rose from the dead. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Salvation is believing in Jesus that he rose from the dead. The gospel. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Later on he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, what must they hear? Well, they need to hear the gospel. The resurrection, uh, it's, it's unique in uh, all, of, all of history. It's the basis of faith. Faith is not a ceremony. You know, a lot of religions, they have some ceremony you go through and then you're, you're okay. Uh, that's not Christianity. Christianity is not a ceremony. Christianity is a relationship. You give your, yourself to the Lord. You, you give your heart to Him. And the, the Bible says Jesus is this unique combination of God-man. He's the Son of David according to the flesh. He's the Son of God according to the Spirit. Uh, the book of Hebrews, let me just read that. And the importance of Jesus being God and being man is that as Christians, we're not coming to a God who doesn't understand us. Uh, that's what he says in Hebrews 4, uh, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He's the perfect Son of God. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Listen, when you're going through temptation, Jesus has been there. But He was successful. <laughs> and that's why He's able to help us. And we give in to temptation. Jesus never did. He's, he's the perfect God. He's the perfect man. And uh, that's what Christianity is found on, founded on, I should say. Uh, when we call ourselves Christians, we're saying, I'm a follower of Christ. I want to be like Jesus. And Christiani Christianity is founded on God's promise, the Word of God. Uh, in 2 Peter, he said, The prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It was God's Word. The Bible is not men telling about God. It's God speaking to man. That's important to understand. Now, that's God's promise. And Christianity is founded on the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. It says in Corinthians, Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ. Now, they need to hear the gospel of Christ. Look, if, if you're still there in Romans, look at verse 14. He says, I'm debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. <coughs> for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, the, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He says, people need to hear the gospel. You know, sincerity is not enough. There are people in all religions who are very sincere, just totally given over to what they're doing. But listen, sincerity is not enough. Faith is believing God's Word, believing God's Son. Uh, other religions are not just worshiping God by another name. The Bible says, neither uh, is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the only way. Let me ask you this morning, are, are you convinced that Christianity is true? Or are you ashamed? You know, Paul was able to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because if Christianity is true, then Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, or no person really is what he's saying, cometh unto the Father but by me. Some would say, oh, that's very bigoted. Yes, it is. It's the narrow way. And he calls it that. There's many that go by the broad way. 
He said, but that leads to destruction. You can go the way everyone else is going, if you don't mind where it ends. Or you can go the narrow way. It's more difficult. The way of Jesus, it's not the easy way, but it leads to life eternal. And that's the difference. That's what people need to hear. They need to hear about Jesus Christ, the promises of God's Word concerning God's Son. Well, what about the question, though? Now, the question we started with was, what about those who've never heard? Well, let me continue this by, by asking, well, why haven't they heard? <laughs> why haven't people heard? Again, in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. I want to show you something there in, in verse 18. At the end of the verse, he says, talking about people, men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The very simple meaning of that is that they suppress the truth. You've seen it. I've seen it. You know, where people, you ask them, listen, can I, can I talk to you about Jesus? No, no, I don't want to talk about that. Unfortunately, in, in our culture, it's become impolite to talk to people about their souls. Man, the devil won in that culture war, didn't he? Uh, people suppress the truth. I, I often ask people, do you ever think about spiritual things? And, you know, quite often I, the answer is, no, not really. They suppress the truth. And God says he put it in them. Somewhere in you is a desire to know the Lord. And you have to resist that. And at some point in everyone's life, there's a time when that desire is, is known. Usually it's when we're, when we're young. We think, oh, yeah, that, I, I want to know the Lord. And yet many suppress it and, and, and put it down. You've seen this in a social sense. When, have you ever had some kid, they call out something that's obviously true, but it's not polite? You know, look at that man, you know, whatever. Shh, 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 don't, don't say that. <laughs> now, culturally, that, that's okay. But when it comes to spiritual things, it's not okay. People are lost. People are sinners. Uh, we're not bigoted to say, to agree with Scripture when he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, one of the reasons people haven't heard is because they suppress the truth. Uh, verse 20 for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Almost any time of the day, every day, you can turn on the TV and see shows about evolution. And some of them are beautifully filmed showing God's creation. And they have to consciously keep themselves from talking about the design and the, the character of the person who made it. They willingly suppress the truth. God says they're clearly seen. If we had some paintings in here, one of the questions you might ask would be, oh, who did this? I remember talking to a person on their porch. They had a, a pot with a plant in it. I said, isn't it interesting that we know someone made the pot, and yet we say no one made the plant? We willingly resist the truth. Now, I say we. I mean uh, mankind in general. I hope, I hope I'm not talking to you. Uh, they suppress the truth, and God says they're without excuse. They're without excuse. They will not hear. Um, th this comes up a lot in the Old Testament as well. Let me just read you one verse. Um, Jeremiah 6, verse 10. Just, just listen to it. He's talking to Israel, and he says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. He said, they just won't hear. And many times, uh, that's the problem. Uh, we'll, we'll take the message, but they, they, won't, they won't hear. Verse 22, he says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image 
made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. As, as I thought about that this week, I, uh, it made me think about the, the idea of people say, I won't believe anything I can't see. I won't believe anything I can't prove. Instead of believing in God, they want to believe in an image. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Now God allows us to go our own way. If we won't follow Him, He says, all right. And yet God has made it possible for us, us to know Him. Do you know that at least twice in history, every person walking on the earth knew the Lord? At creation and after the flood. And man, you, you read Scripture and how soon uh, we turn away from the Lord because of sin. Uh, there's whole civilizations have disappeared. You know, uh, there's explorers. They went through Central America, South America. They'd find, oh, and there used to be millions of people lived here that were organized and intelligent and knew about science. And they disappeared because they became fools. They suppressed the truth. And they, they, they went their own foolish way. You know, one of the, the reasons people haven't heard is because they won't hear. They suppress the truth. But you know, the other reason is because Christians don't tell them. <laughs> Sometimes after you've been a Christian for a while, you get to where you don't really like non-Christians. You know, Man, they're, they're mean and nasty and they make fun of us. And you need to be careful. God loves them. God knows them by name. He, know, he says he knows the number of hairs on their head. <laughs> Man, he doesn't have to count them. He just knows. God knows everything. Uh, oftentimes as Christians, we just don't tell them. Paul said, I'm debtor. So I'm ready to preach the gospel. He'd been given the message. He said, now it's time to take it on. Turn to Romans chapter 10 there and, and verse uh, 13. Romans chapter 10 is where he talks about trusting Christ. Verse 13 is a verse I often use. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he poses a series of questions. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. See, our responsibility is to tell them, to do our best to, to tell people. I remember at one church I was at, uh, an elderly man came along to church, and he'd been friends with a lady who went to our church for a long time. And what his comment was, I kept hoping she'd invite me. <laughs> he eventually got saved. Uh, first time I'd ever discipled uh, somebody over 80. <laughs> it was really interesting, a really interesting guy. He'd, Anyway, I won't tell you about him, but uh, I did his funeral as, uh, as well. And, you know, what a blessing it was to, to know that he trusted Christ as his Savior. Our responsibility is to tell them. Sometimes that just means inviting them. Will they all believe? Of course not. He says in Romans 10, 16, they've not all obeyed the gospel. Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Many times they won't believe, but sometimes they will. You know, not everybody believed Jesus when he preached. It says in Matthew 13 how that he did not many mighty miracles there because of their unbelief. I think that was Nazareth he was talking about. Uh, we need to tell them. God tells us, go ye into all the world. And sometimes, sometimes I think we're motivated by the wrong re reason. There's a, there's a lot of things that, that might motivate us to take the gospel. One is the fact that people go to hell. But you know what? That's not our main motive. Uh, sometimes it's the terrible condition that sin brings. You know, there's some awful things going on in our world because of sin. People get away from God. Man, it's amazing what they can do. But you know, that's not the main motive to tell people about Jesus. Uh, we might think, well, we need to help our missionaries. Uh, you know, none of, none of those are bad motives. But you know, the main motive for us to take the gospel is because we love and want to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, he talks about how it's the love of Christ that constrains us. Listen to the, to the rest of the verse. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that 
They which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. <laughs> Christ died for us because we were all dead in trespasses and sins. And when we get saved, when we get life, we should share it with others. <laughs> Folks, we, we have a, a call, and, and the main motive is the love of Christ. It's not that just that people need to be saved. It's not that hell is yawning open, waiting to receive them. It's that Christ has said, the one who died for us has said, share the gospel. I came across this quote. He said, we forget that the one great reason underneath all missionary enterprise is not the elevation of the people nor their needs, but first and foremost, the command of Jesus Christ. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's the main motive. Do we love him? He said the challenge does not come on the line that people are difficult to get saved, but along the line of our own personal relationship to Christ. Believe ye that I'm able to do this. See, the problem is not them, it's us. <laughs> it's not, oh, they're hard to reach. It's, it's hard for me to love the Lord enough to go. Do we love him? Will we obey him? Well, the question is, what about those who've never heard? Oftentimes if, when I'm asked that, I, I ask the person, well, let me ask you, would you be willing to tell them? Because usually they're not really concerned whether people have heard or not. They're concerned with whether God is fair or not. How can we tell them? Well, I believe scripturally that the best method is God's method. <laughs> and God's method is the local church. Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. It's my belief that when God says both, that means the church. It's just a physical fact. None of us can be in two places at once, all right? And the way we can do both is as a church, is that as a group, as a God-called band of people. The, there's an illustration of that in uh, the church of Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 1 and, and verse 8. He says, From you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every faith, I'm sorry, in every place, your faith to God were to spread abroad. See, as a church, they were able to fulfill the Great Commission. They could witness where they were. They could send others to go to other places. They could support missionaries. Uh, they could do the, the things that God calls us to do. See, people coming to the Lord is not going to happen by waiting for them to come to us. Uh, we can paint our building, make it look nice, and yeah, we can have lots of nice programs and, and so on, but uh, the call is for us to go and bring them. Uh, I came across an article about comeback churches. You know, sometimes churches fail. They disappear. But there was a whole series of churches that were failing that were renewed. And they began to look at what was happening. And they found out, uh, the man said, it's more of a heart issue than one of strategy or style. They, they didn't need new music. They didn't need a new program. He says, nearly all growing churches have an outreach strategy, and almost all declining churches do not. <laughs> they begin to have a heart for reaching people. If we'll give ourselves to to missions here and, and, and around the world, uh, we'll get the blessing that others will, will join us. You know, reaching people starts with personal evangelism. Really, that was my theme all of last year. Holding out the light, you know, as an individual, bringing the lost to Christ. Uh, part of, uh, of missions is the preaching in our church. You know, one of the main things we do uh, when we gather together is, is the preaching. And God has said in 1 Corinthians, God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. He says later on in, in that same passage, we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. We preach Christ. And then we send out missionaries. You know, there's one, more than one Arrow to our bow. String to our bow. I'm not sure how that phrase goes. Uh, we send out missionaries, worldwide missions. And uh, like we've read, missionaries don't just go, they're sent. They're sent from churches. And 
We need to keep our churches strong because the light that shines the farthest shines the brightest at home. Missions. Well, the question is, what about those who've never heard? Well, the simple answer is, without Jesus Christ, they go to hell. Isn't that a stark answer? It's very simple. But you know, God has made a promise. There's, there's hope in, in the midst of that. God has made the promise that if they will seek him, he'll be found of them. Yeah, I've heard more than one missionary give the testimony that they've gone somewhere and, the person, and a person has said, I asked, and they would just name some generic idea of God, I asked God to let me know him. I wanted to know him. And the way God answers that prayer is he sends one of us, a Christian. I've heard that testimony over and over from missionaries in, in various places. God makes a promise. Uh, it's found, for instance, in Jeremiah when he says, uh, Ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. It's Jeremiah 29, verse, uh, verse 13. I love that verse. But you know, when people don't hear about the Lord and when people refuse the Lord, uh, it shouldn't surprise us that people should, would go to hell. What should surprise us is that God would choose to save any of us. <laughs> really, that's the amazing thing. And God has chosen to save. The Bible says in Romans 5, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God reached out to us. And, and he started that right at the beginning, right as after sin came, as we saw in Genesis 3, right through history. You know, before Christ came, it was faith in the coming Savior. Boy, I'm glad I live after the cross. Uh, it just seems so much easier now. We can look back in history and see Christ came. And our faith is in, in the Christ of the Scriptures. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, God has done His part. He's given us the Gospel. He's given us the Bible, His Son. And now it's time for us to do our part. As Christians, if you're a Christian this morning, we need to be a, a witness. We need to send out missionaries. Now, let me encourage you, you know, carry a Gospel track. Uh, speak out when you can. Uh, Wednesdays, we're learning about uh, talking to people about the Lord. Uh, you, you know, we, we have these signs around give and go and pray and send. Uh, that's all part of what God has asked us to do. Uh, what we're saying this morning is take the Great Commission seriously. It's great. A and it's vital for those who are lost. And if we love Him, He said we'll keep His commandments. But you know, maybe there are some here that don't know Christ. To take the gospel, you need to first receive the gospel. Yeah. Now, it's possible to point people to Jesus without ever having been there yourself. There are, there are signs around Brisbane that point to Brisbane. Those signs never go to Brisbane. There's people like that. They say, oh, yeah, you need to go to that church. Maybe they're members of churches, but they've never come to Christ themselves. Well, what a tragedy it would be to stand before God and have pointed others and never have gone yourself. It's so important that you know this morning your relationship to the Lord. And the Bible says it's only through Christ. It's the gospel that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again. And we can believe that, and it'll change our lives because he says he takes up residence in us. Uh, what a blessing it is. God's word. What about those who've never heard? Well, our responsibility is to tell them. And that's all we can do. We can pray, we can give, we can go, we can tell them. Now, these are things that God has given us to do. But it starts with trusting Christ yourself. Uh, the best advocate for something is someone who's been through it. And if you've been saved, uh, that should, uh, that's all you need to be able to share Christ with others. You can give witness of what, what the Lord has, has done for you. This morning we're going to uh, take our song books. If I can find the page here. Page 156 is the song, Is Your All on the Altar? <laughs>